the camera opens on a forest at the bottom of a cliff. The glare so intense that the scene looks like something out of a painting. A young girl awakes at the bottom of this cliff and staggers out of the forest, down the steps, past the basketball courts, past a supermarket that wasn't there, through what was once a bustling town square, to a mailbox that maybe in a far off time belonged to her. But it does not last long, as whatever moments that are currently happening are soon lost and fade away like a bad dream. Every now and again, you play a video game that leaves you sitting in your chair just like, damn, that has to be the best video game I have ever played. And for me, that game was Night in the Woods. Releasing in 2017, Night in the Woods was met with critical acclaim. Jacksepticeye played it all the way through, and it got a couple of well-deserved video essays talking about its rich world and story. It even won a couple of awards. But as new things released to take its place, the hype for the game fizzled out, now left with only a few cult followers, and not even close to the mainstream eye. In my opinion, Night in the Woods is the greatest video game ever made. And I know that sounds like a stretch, but for me at least, it's true. I bought this game when it came out at age 14, and I'm gonna be honest, I didn't get the whole experience. I thought the music was nice, and the characters were pretty funny, and the plot was satisfying, but having dusted off the old Steam library recently, I decided to give this game another go. Hey, check it out. It's my old laptop. Look, it's got a Razer sticker on it. That's how you know I was a real gamer back in the day. Oh my god, this thing is... A disaster. And man, was I missing out. So what's this game's deal? Well, Night in the Woods is heavily driven by its story, characters, and setting. But before we get into all of that, I just want to talk about the little things. The game takes place in the modern day, or 2017, in a town called Possum Springs. It's your classic, old-timey, rust-belt town whose most prosperous days are well behind it. You play as Mae Borowski, a 20-year-old college dropout returning home after only two years, and for right now, that's really all you need to know. She comes home only to find out that many of the things she used to love about her town, like the Italian place she would eat at, the grocery store that her family shopped at, and many other small things were no longer there. The music and the art style really helps sell that Midwest America small town aesthetic that the game is going for. Lots of fall colors and an overall abundance of bloom and other lighting effects gives the game a completely unique look and feel to it. Everything in this game moves, whether it's the leaves under your feet as you romp through town square, the people passing by on their way to work, or the wildlife that populates the town. The little details that this game has really blows me away. Even the text boxes and the characters themselves move all the time, and it's this motion that makes Night in the Woods settings so believable. Here's a small town girl who comes home to her small town where everything makes sense. It's a believable world with a believable setting and believable characters. This is further enhanced by the music, which was composed by Alec Holoka, the main programmer for the entire game. And actually, this is a good time to mention who exactly made this game. The development team was called Infinite Fall, and the game was published by Finji. If you ask me, the team of Scott Benson, Bethany Hockenberry, and Alec Holoka was a thing of beauty. And I'll talk about that near the end of this video, but for now, you just need to know the names of these three developers. Overall, I think the game has a beautiful and unique art style that makes everything that is about to happen seem all that more immersive. Because even though the art direction and quality assurance of this game was off the charts, Night in the Woods was absolutely carried by its story, setting, and characters. So let's talk about that next. But before we can talk about the actual plot of this game, we need to establish everything else, i.e. the characters. I've already mentioned that we play as Mae Borowski, who dropped out of college and returned to Possum Springs. She's met with her old friends from high school, Beatrice Santello and Gregory Lee, along with his boyfriend, Angus. Beatrice is somewhat depressed, who essentially runs everything going on at her father's store, the old pickaxe. She's been forced to grow up extremely fast and wasn't able to go to college like May was. On the other hand, we have Greg, who's the complete opposite, a loud and rowdy delinquent who wants nothing more than to do some good old-fashioned crimes with May now that she's home from school. Both of these characters play an incredibly intricate role in not only the plot of Night in the Woods, but in May's life. 
B is the more adult side of her, the one that is conscious about the future and thinks very logically throughout the entire game, always being the voice of reason anytime Mei wants to do something stupid. Meanwhile, Greg is the go 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 part of Mei that is desperately holding on to whatever childhood she has left. Most of the time spent playing Night in the Woods will be with one of these two friends, each having their own separate storyline that has very little to do with what I gather the main story is about. There's B's acceptance of May's inability to relate to her very real-world problems while grappling with the idea herself of May throwing away the one thing she wants more than anything else. And then there's Greg's storyline about the fear of growing up and not wanting to let go of the things you hold dear to your heart, wanting to be a kid but being forced to become an adult. On top of these side missions, there's one main overarching story that centers around May and her struggles with, well, herself. Apparently something happened to her at college that caused her to drop out, and each day you'll wake up and choose a friend to hang out with for the rest of that day. However, to get the full experience of Night in the Woods, you'll need to do at least two full playthroughs, one focusing on B's story and the other focusing on Greg's story. So without further ado, let's get into the full meat and potatoes of this insane video game. Night in the Woods opens up in a really strange way, with a poem, the only sound being the wind flowing through presumably an open window as you read. In the year Grandad died, we had the worst flood since 1998. Greg got trapped on top of a doghouse and the power was out for two days. Casey Hartley came by in his dad's boat and I laughed when I saw him. Grandad left me an apple crate of books. He loved ghost stories and quoted them to himself in the hospital bed. They feared death so they ate the young. On his last day, he sat up suddenly and stared bug-eyed through the window at the old trains, rattling to somewhere else, from somewhere else. He turned to my dad, eyes still wide. This house is haunted, he said, and died. It's very unsettling and really an amazing way to start this game. Already, we get a feel for the main character and their relationship with this town and the people in it. In fact, you can actually change some of the lines of the poem and get different insights into the world. Unfortunately, this has no real effect over the rest of the game, which I think is a super missed opportunity. Like, imagine if changing the outcome of this poem had a ripple effect throughout the entire game. But whatever. When the actual game starts, we arrive at the bus station, and immediately, one thing is made painfully clear. May Borowski is an asshole. Oh, great. It's not like I was expecting a party or anything, but I figured somebody would be here. Like, really? Imagine your parents work their entire lives preparing for one of their children to go to college, only for them to drop out after two years and return being like, why isn't anyone here? Talk about a slap in the face. And there's not much to do here other than watch a trashy news show, so we leave. But we can't even do that because there's a janitor fixing a door leading outside. Thankfully, he finishes up once we get him a soda from the vending machine. Now's probably a good time to mention something I forgot. Night in the Woods has a lot of different minigames, and they're peppered throughout the entire game. They all use May's hands in some way, and it really adds a lot of immersion. Instead of just picking the can out of the machine with a text box that says something like, you got soda, we actually physically grab the soda can and give it to the guy. It's a really nice detail that's everywhere in this game. So now that the door is fixed, we can leave. And as we walk back to town, we can really get an idea of May's relationship with Possum Springs. Talking about the abandoned glass factory and the bus stop being the newest thing in town. Talking about the sound of the train like it's an old friend and even having the gall to call her parents negligent. Yikes. We hike through the woods into a small ravine that we have to climb out of. Surely nothing bad will happen, right? I'm not gonna die in this hole, huh? Surely that's not foreshadowing to anything later in the game. After learning that we can Super Mario triple jump, we get arrested by our Aunt Molly, one of the local policemen, and are sent home, where we basically jump scare our parents because they thought May was coming home tomorrow. So, 
May doesn't have a cell phone or anything that she could use to let them know that she's here now. Really? Nothing at all? Despite this game taking place in the modern day? Okay. So we go to bed. And there's this really nice animation of May getting into her bed that adds a lot of character to this well, character. Like, instead of a fade to black animation with some stupid shit like, the next day, dot dot dot, we actually physically watch May go to bed. We wake to our mom asking us if we want to talk about leaving college, which May completely denies. Instead of facing her problems head on, we just dip to go hang out with our old friends. Her mom is super sweet and very understanding of May's situation. And that really sucks. <laughs> it's insane. This one character destroys the immersion this game has for me. If I dropped out of college so fast that my own parents didn't know when I was coming home, do you think they would be like, oh honey, it's okay if you don't wanna talk about it right now, we could talk about it No, of course they wouldn't, they would be pissed. And it's really weird to say May's mom just totally fine with her returning on such short notice and giving literally no explanation of what's been going on. So yeah, after that nice conversation with our far too caring mother, we head off into the town of Possum Springs for the very first time. It's a nice little walk through the town square. The leaves move when you run over them, kids will be dashing past you playing some game, people complaining about losing their jobs, and animals running up and down trees. On top of that, this really nice electric piano melody plays in the background that's basically just the icing on the cake. At the top of the hill, we can find a new stand that has local events happening around Possum Springs. Harfest is coming up, which is essentially a harvest festival, if you couldn't gather that, as well as a missing poster for a kid named Casey Hartley, who is the same kid mentioned in the opening poem. He and May were friends, and now apparently he's gone. Also, there's a ball of string, which is a really funny jab at every character being some kind of anthropomorphic animal. By the way, can we talk about that? Why are they animals? There are normal animals walking around Possum Springs, so why are the people animals too? It's weird. Maybe it's just a design choice, but... Honestly, at this point, I have no idea. Walking further through the town, we come across the Snack Falcon, where our good friend Greg works. He's basically the rowdy teen side of May, and the two have been friends since basically forever. Greg shows his excitement for May's return and informs her that their old band is back together. So we up and ditch work like a normal person to go play some music. This is a cool mini game that's basically a direct clone of Guitar Hero. One thing to note is the animations that play in your peripheral vision. Because you're focused on the notes and not the people, you only see flashes of certain lyrics in the song and the instruments that each character plays. This is also the first time we've seen B in over two years, and their interaction is about as awkward as you think it would be. After the song, we hit up the local diner for some pizza, where Greg informs May that Casey most likely hopped a train to get out of Possum Springs and never came back. Hence why we see posters for him on the news board. And instead of playing out of the diner, we just pay. Because at this point, Greg, B, and Angus are all employed and have jobs, unlike May. Ah, what a nice first day back in Possum Springs. Got to see the boys, played some songs, and... What is that? Is that... Is that an arm? There's an arm on the ground. So, May does what any normal person would do, and she pokes it with a stick. And again, instead of getting some text box that says, May pokes the arm with the stick, we actually get to poke the arm with the stick revealing a weird tattoo on its forearm. However, our detective time is cut short by Aunt Molly, who, naturally, instructs everyone to move away from the arm because that's like tampering with evidence. So B drives May home and we have this really strange conversation about her parents. B doesn't like this, so she tells May to get out of her car. I like these car scenes, and there are some good ones later in the game, so for the devs to actually include a car scene like this instead of, again, just a text box that says, B drives May home, is so cool. I know I sound like a broken record with the box thing, but you guys, AAA games would not do this. Don't lie, I know you think they would, but they wouldn't. That's literally why I'm making this video. The next day, we awake to the hard truth that, <clears throat> Viruses have attacked our laptop in the 36 hours we've been home. So we have to go to the video outpost 2 to get our laptop fixed. Turns out this is where Angus works and he's some kind of computer whiz, so we have to ask him for some magic. Hey May, got cups on my ears. Wow, 
That's great, dude. God, I love Greg. TLDR, Angus fixes our laptop and we can finally use it again. And guys, you might not believe this, but there is an entire other video game on May's laptop. Like, not a short game either. It's a dungeon crawler that has bosses and levels and like an entire ass video game in it. You basically have to kill a bunch of guys and find keys hidden throughout the level that unlock a boss at the end. It's long too. Like there was some serious thought put into this little tiny insignificant almost Easter egg that you could never even see if you didn't click on this app. No joke, you never actually have to use the laptop. You can play all of Night in the Woods without ever touching it after this point. So there are people out there who have played this game and have never even seen this part. Wow. Anyway, after that, Greg informs us over chat that he's going to a big party in the state park and that we're invited. Awesome. Sounds like a plan. So the next day, we coerce B into driving us up to the state park for the party. There isn't anything else really to do in Possum Springs at this point, so we go home and get ourselves pretty for the big night. Turns out, May's a little screwy in the head and has some serious self-worth issues. Oh, I'm too fat. Oh, I have nightmare eyes. It's like, geez, okay, just stay home if you're gonna be like that, man. What are you, me? But whatever, no time to think about that now, as we have a party to go to. Wow. Awesome. What was that, like five minutes into the night and we're already wasted and puking our guts out? Damn, May, you're really losing points right now. So since the party was cut a little bit short, on the way home, May tries to apologize for being, well, a complete mess and ruining the party. However, she's blackout drunk and has no idea what she's talking about. This is where we learn that B's mom is actually dead, and somehow May already knew this? She knew it and just happened to forget about one of her best friend's dead mom. You know, that's just the kind of person May is. Dead mom? Psh, I'm depressed too, give me a break. <laughs> that was a little dark. So since we're hammered, we collapse in bed. I mean, wouldn't you? Oh boy. Yeah, so that's another thing I didn't mention. Night in the Woods has a lot of these dream sequences. I think there are around six in total, and each one follows almost the same story. This one's a little strange. We have a baseball bat and can basically smash the shit out of anything we want. We can make the Durkelsberg... Dur... Dur... Durkelis... Durkelsberg signs say killer, which you are legally obligated to do because it was in the trailer, break garbage cans, cars, and lights. At the end, we smash this giant statue that, to this day, I couldn't tell you what it symbolizes. I don't know, the other dreams that take place later in the game make more sense and fit better in the context of May's psyche, but I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get there. The next day is where the main game really begins. We wake up like usual, keep secrets from our mother, and go off on our way to hang out with friends. It's here where we meet Germ, another small side character. He's younger than the main crew, still in high school, and is friends with Greg. He has his own entire side story that I didn't manage to record, but you can go out and do some pretty cool stuff with him. After talking to Greg again, we head out to band practice. I don't know about you, but if my best friend got wasted, monologued about being a trash mammal, and almost puked in my car, I wouldn't want to hang out with them anymore. But because of video games, we have a choice after band practice to hang out with either Greg or B. Like I said at the beginning of this video, each friend has their own separate storyline, and for the sake of being thorough with this video, I'll be going over each one separately in detail. So, because we need to pick a starting point, let's go with B's story. Beatrice Santello is my favorite character in Night in the Woods. She's by far the most fleshed out and realistic person in the entire cast, and is the one that is written the best. A lot of this game's charm comes from the believability of the characters, and B is certainly the most so. She runs the Old Pickaxe, a store that her family has owned for generations, and basically does everything all on her own. The first day spent with her is visiting the old Fort Lucene Mall, and doing some shopping. And by shopping, I mean shoplifting. You see, B and May were in scouts together. They met when they were stuck in a group project and hit it off. They went to this mall all the time when they were younger and they talk about all the fun stuff that happened there. It makes the place seem less like a map than a video game and more like an actual place where actual people made actual memories. So the only logical thing to do 
is to steal from the local Hot Topic. This is another hand minigame where we have to steal a belt buckle while the shopkeeper isn't looking. Again, it's another nice touch that I really like. After the theft, we stop to eat some food and May gossips about high school drama. Thankfully, we don't do that for long as May gets bored of things that don't involve her directly very easily. So instead, we decide to see how fast we can get ourselves kicked out of the mall by climbing on top of some modern art and spraying people with water. Overall, it's a really nice introduction to B and May's relationship. I mean, after having someone you thought was a friend forget about your dead mother and not understand any of your very real-world adult problems, you would hope they would make it up to you. And if there's one thing that May can do really well, it's have at least a little fun. When we get home, we have another weird dream, and this one's honestly my favorite. We have to find four musicians that each add a layer to the score in the background. This time we jump around a beautiful space-themed city that has us use power lines to get around and chimneys to make jumps. After we activate all four musicians, we go back to the start of the level and... Good morning, everyone! Oh, that was totally normal. I promise. It's time for the next mission with B, and honestly, I have no idea why she's letting us do this, but we have to go on a house call with her. An old woman who lives up in the mountains has a broken furnace, and we need to go fix it. So while B is doing that, we have to engineer our own elegant solution to the problem with whatever is lying around this lady's basement. Thankfully, that doesn't work, and B fixes the furnace. Too bad the old woman locks us in. Come on, guys, give her a break. She's old old and hard of hearing. So hard of hearing, in fact, that she doesn't hear us when we try to scream for help. But you know what she could hear? A broken furnace. Once we finally get outside, May notices that B isn't feeling all that great, so we have to cheer her up. We grab these fireflies and bring them back to her, which makes her feel a lot better. She notices that May has a lot of pent-up aggression and tries to give her some advice for what to do with all of it. She mentions that she could channel that into something useful. However, May disagrees and says that she needs to bottle all of it up and repress it. And if you know anything about anger issues, that's really not good. If you're mad all the time or have some vendetta against reality, you need to find a healthy way to channel that shit, not keep Keep it all locked up. So after that lighthearted conversation, it's time for the second dream. This one takes place in a more industrial setting. We still have to activate four musicians, but the song that plays in the background is different. Again, I really love these sequences. They add a lot of immersion to the game and give us a look into May's psyche. But even just how they look, with the bright blues and pinks of the dream world contrasted against the more plain browns, yellows, and reds of Possum Springs, it just looks mystical. Another day, another B mission. This time, we have to go shopping for dinner. If you ask me, this mission seems really out of place in this game. Maybe I'm just tooting my own horn here, but every other mission in the game has us out doing a really interesting thing in a really interesting place. The Ham Panther Grocery Store is the one location in all of Night in the Woods that has literally no exploitability. You just pick some sides and talk to your dad who happens to work at the deli. It's funny. Depending on what sides you choose, you get different dialogue boxes where B's dad either likes it or doesn't. And now's actually a good time to talk about B's dad. He's the technical owner of the old pickaxe, but ever since B's mom died, he's been wasting away on his couch, forcing B to do basically all the work. This would obviously make it impossible for B to go to college, and it's why she seems so distant to us. She's been hiding her disdain for us after she learned we dropped out, because she couldn't possibly believe that May would seemingly throw away the one thing she wants more than anything else. This mission is probably the best example of May just not being a good person. But I mean, could you blame her? As B puts it, she's a child woman with no job, no responsibilities, and no consequences for her actions. May could never really understand that B's in the situation she's in because she literally can't do anything else. And honestly, that's really powerful. Like I said before, B's storyline is very set in reality, and when we talk about Greg later in this video, you'll see what I mean. After B explodes in her face, 
we leave. But unlike in every other mission where the screen just fades to black and we wind up in our house, we have to just slowly walk out of B's apartment, past her dad who's asleep, who we now know is such a humongous piece of shit. It's a really honestly sad moment in this game and nails that uncomfortable atmosphere really nicely. Okay, I'm gonna skip ahead in the game a little bit to talk about the conclusion of B's story before we go talking about the rest of the game, and I'm gonna do the same thing with Greg. For some reason, Night in the Woods spreads its conclusion way out and doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me, but whatever. B's final mission is a party that she likes to drive to every now and then. They're thrown by her old friend Jackie and for some reason lets May tag along. We could do some dancing and that's pretty fun, but what we're really here for is socializing. So we chatted up with B and her new acquaintances. This part hurts to watch. We have literally no choice here. We just have to sit back and watch May spill every single secret that B has kept to herself. You see, she's convinced everyone at these parties that she was a normal college student just like them, when in reality, she runs the old pickaxe. And of course, May just had to barge in and be like, oh yeah, she's so responsible, right? Tell him, B. God, what an idiot. Naturally, B gets cold feet and runs off out of embarrassment, so we have to chase her down. We run across rooftops and slide down wet slopes, basically the whole city, until we eventually find her sitting on a bench by the river. We try to talk to her, but she is not having it. She's done with May's continued lack of caring for her problems and lack of attempted understanding of her situation. She talks about lying awake at night, thinking of what it would be like to go to college. This thing that May is just so over already is her wild this dream. She would give everything to go to college. And here's a person who had the world on a silver platter who threw it all away because it was too much. The fact is, B and May could never understand each other. One experienced the soul-crushing loss of her mother to cancer, and the other is basically just a larger high school student with nothing to lose. And yet, despite their complete opposing ideals, they make that friendship work. They may be stuck in Possum Springs, but at least they can be stuck together. They aren't best friends, but more like best available friend. And with that, B's storyline concludes. It's a somber end to a somber story, but it's one of the best I've played through in any video game. It hits all the right notes and manages to condense such horrible real trauma down into an easily digestible game. And believe it or not, we aren't even halfway done. Because there's another person that we must explore. Greg. So let's do that. Also, if you've made it this far, please subscribe and hit the bell. Videos like this are extremely hard to make if you can't already tell by the runtime, and subscribing would mean the world to me. Alright, back to the game. Greg's storyline is almost the complete opposite of B's, all about focusing on the fun of life and holding on to your childhood, with the first mission being titled Crimes and taking place at the abandoned food donkey. Note that the dreams that were mentioned during B's storyline also happen at the end of every mission in Greg's storyline, so yeah. We break in with the help of a thug named Steve to steal the head of some animatronic creature. After some light parkour, we find a key to the back room where Freddy Fazbear, I mean, um, the animatronic heads are. Once we pick one, we have to lug it up some stairs. This is probably the worst minigame in the entire game. You have to time your inputs just right, or else you fall all the way down the staircase. It's nauseating. Not to mention the fact that every now and then, Greg will want to walk back a step, which is just like, why? But whatever, we get things up to the stairs and hit up the diner. It's here where Greg spills the beans on his plans with Angus. Since Possum Springs is pretty much an empty shithole, they want to up and leave to a town called Bright Harbor. This is why Greg and Angus are both working full time. So since May is back in town, Greg's been sucked back into that irresponsible life that he and May led back in high school. He's forced to choose his best friend or his future, and that's a tough choice to make. The next day, we have to go look for more parts for the animatronic thing we stole last night. This involves finding an abandoned car and stealing its battery. So May does what May does best, and smashes the complete shit out of the car before electrocuting herself on the battery and almost dying. I'm sensing a pattern here. Now that we have the battery, we can finally build the animatronic. It's kind of like Legos. Absurd and twisted Legos out of a Stanley Kubrick film, but yeah, Legos. Now all we have to do is turn the thing on. Incredible. Honestly, a pretty underwhelming mission. I mean, 
other than Meg getting her comeuppance, of course. I don't know. So far, Greg's story just doesn't hold as much weight as B's. Maybe that's the point, but we aren't quite done yet, so let's just keep moving. Next up, we have Smashing Light Bulbs, which is a repeatable side mission where May can... <laughs> smash light bulbs. Why are they doing this? I have no clue, but it's a fun little minigame that takes your mind off of the other crazy stuff that's happening around Possum Springs. The next real mission is titled Wounds, and it's where May and Greg go out into the woods and have some fun. Can I just say how amazingly beautiful this bike scene is? Just May and Greg on a bike riding through the fields of Possum Springs past an abandoned glass factory. God, it's so pretty. Again, a completely pointless detail that adds nothing to the actual game other than they got on a bike and rode to a forest. Once at said forest, we have a nice friendly knife fight with Greg. It's pretty simple. Stab him before he can stab you. First person to wuss out three times loses. Oh yeah, I kicked his ass. I'm so good at video games, dude. After, it's time for the range challenge, where we use Greg's crossbow to shoot at the statue of what Greg calls the god of the forest. Oh man, come on, May. Hold that crossbow steady. I can't even shoot these birds properly. So after losing pretty much all of Greg's bolts, he runs down to the bank of a large lake to have a little heart to heart. Angus apparently comes from a really bad upbringing and Greg feels like he needs him. He's worried about moving away and all the work that the two have been doing to make their lives worth living. Is it all for nothing? He's fighting with his inner child to make the right choice. Meanwhile, May is just bootlegging along with him, doing crimes, making him revert back to his younger, more irresponsible self and undoing all the good that he's been choosing. It's really hard growing up and Greg and Angus are somewhat being forced to. It sucks, but in this moment at the lake where Greg realizes that he's human, or, you know, something like that. And makes mistakes just like everyone else around him. So, yeah, May is an asshole for all this. But she's real. She's the only real friend Greg really has besides Angus. And we leave this mission just standing on the side of a lake, looking at the birds silently. It's just a really beautiful moment. Greg's final mission is titled Legends, and it takes place on a lovely evening drive to the Donut Wolf. However, things aren't as they seem. I know this is a video game and all, and none of these people are real or even people, but you can definitely cut the air in here with a steak knife. It seems that Angus isn't exactly having a great time. Oh, yeah, I, that'll do it. While Greg and Angus fight about what to do, May discovers a spare tire in the back, so it's off to Donut Wolf. Yay! Even once we arrive at the restaurant, the tension is thick. After ordering, May excuses herself to go to the bathroom. Yeah, you think? Like, come on, May, you couldn't have seen this coming? Strolling back into town to f with Greg while they're so close to their goal of moving away? Yeah, I think things would get a little stressful. So like every time something doesn't go her way, May destroys the bathroom almost completely. And then May just goes back to the table like, so guys, what's new? Like what? And why do we have to make ourselves sick to answer that question? Yeah, so it turns out donuts aren't all that great for your stomach and May pukes her guts out again. And it's here, while all three are sitting on the side of the road, does Greg really open up. And he tells us a story about living with his uncle and letting sheep loose from their pen, watching them run down the hill and be splattered by a semi-truck. He mentions that nearly all of them died that day, but one survived. That's how he looks at his relationship with Angus. He wants to be the sheep that got away, and he's taking Angus with him. It's touching in a way. After he finishes, they sit in silence before May comes in with a memory of a night in high school where they almost burned down the whole place. Apparently, kids who go there still talk about it to this day, almost like a legend. And in this moment, May realizes that's what they need to be, legends. They may not be able to hang out and be friends forever, but they can at least be legends. Greg has to grow up, and May has to let go of the past, but at the very least, they can still be legends. And that ends Greg's story. It's not as emotionally damaging as B's story, but it's still touching in its own way. While B was very down to earth and crushing, really, Greg's was much more lighthearted in comparison. And I think that was done on purpose by the writers to reflect each character's personality. B gets to be B, and Greg gets to be Greg. 
There aren't any distractions keeping them from being themselves. And that, to me, is what makes the writing in this game so good. But we still aren't done, because we have one more character that needs closure, and that's none other than Mae Borowski herself, the poster child of this game, and the center of all the madness. So let's go one more time into the woods. May's story picks up right before Legends, if you're doing Greg's route, and Proximity if you're doing B's route. That's why I had to split this video up so weird. The game truly begins on the night of Harfest. Think of it as like this world's version of Halloween. Wait a minute. Anyway, we can walk around the town and breathe in the fall air, or we can head back to our house and get ready for the big night. And since there isn't anything super important to do in Possum Springs right now, we should go home and change into our epic witch dagger costume. Harfest is a really cool part of this game. The town is totally different, and there are people walking around everywhere. You could play mini games and talk to NPCs that you previously couldn't talk to, but the main thing to do is head over to the old pickaxe, where it turns out B is supposed to be putting on the traditional Harfest play about how Possum Springs came to be. Unfortunately, she's down a man. And guess what? We're just in time. So we participate in the play and everything goes smoothly. Hey look, it's the janitor! Oh sh! There it is! There it is! Title drop! Roll credits! No, 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 I'm just kidding. But the things that the janitor says in this play are super cryptic and weird. But whatever, no time to think about that now because the play just is over and all of our friends have prior obligations that they must attend to, leaving ourselves alone. This is garbage. Oh, right, yep, got it, great, cool, kid getting kidnapped on the side of the road by some thing in a trench coat, nah, it's fine, it's fine. So we chase this thing through the parking lots to the edge of the woods by the basketball courts, and it somehow manages to hop an entire ass chain link fence while carrying someone leading May to believe it was some kind of ghost. That night, we don't have a normal dream. It's not the bright and colorful dream world that we know so well at this point, but rather a scene of pure darkness, an eerie red glow emanating from nowhere, and a score of nothing but distorted screams and clanking noises. We walk down the hill to an old well where the noises get louder and louder, and then the dream ends. The next day, we head out to band practice like nothing happened. It also happens to be raining in Possum Springs, which gives the town a completely new aesthetic. It's amazing what Scott Benson was able to do with how this game looks, because he made a simple thing like rain make Possum Springs look entirely different. The new score and the pitter-patter of raindrops on concrete is awesome, and just a simple thing like changing the color of the skybox makes the town look so much more alive. Anyway, after band practice, we tell the gang what happened, and since May is, well, May, at this point, you should know that she can't just sit back and do nothing, she must find the truth. And so, we go on a search for the truth, starting at the library, where B believes we could find some leads on anything ghost-related. Even though the person May saw was clearly not a ghost, we find the microfiche and gather three leads. The local historical society, the graveyard, and Possum Jump. The historical society is this old haunted house-looking place where they talk about the history of Possum Springs, the graveyard is the graveyard, and Possum Jump is the local state park. So let's start with the historical society. May and Greg jump on his bike and pedal over to the house after dark. Why they couldn't go in just during open hours is beyond me, but whatever. Let's just pick this lock and get inside. 
Okay, anyway, the house itself is confusing, with a total of five different elevators. While we go and explore, we notice that there are sounds coming from other places in the house. One of these sounds being footsteps. Okay, time to go. We need to find a paperclip so that Greg can pick the lock to the last elevator because I guess that's how elevators work now. Only to realize that this particular elevator goes back to the basement where they started. So we have to pick another lock to another elevator that takes us to the attic? Well, at least there's a window to break out of. However, before we can do that, May spots a painting that makes her suddenly stop like they aren't being chased by someone. It's a weird painting of this goat in space and May swears that she's seen it before. Well, whatever it is, there's no time to worry about it now, because there is definitely still a guy chasing us. So we hop out of the window and rush down the fire escape. Yeah, I'm sure that's no biggie. That night, our dream is not so normal. Instead of running around a magical dream city talking to musicians, we open up in a massive moon field. As we walk, we come across this massive cat that seems to be a god of some sorts. I made a boo -boo, yeah. One thing to note is that it doesn't talk in text boxes, but just in space, everywhere. We can ask it questions, none of which really giving a proper answer. May asks why she is there, and the cat, god, thing, whatever it is, responds with monstrous existence. Now, this scene is extremely important to the overall theme of Night in the Woods. As May delves further and further into the secrets of Possum Springs, more bad things will happen to her in search of the truth. It's here I would like to draw some parallels to another game that has a similar theme, Omori. However, in that game, you must uncover a truth that you yourself have hidden inside your own mind, while in Night in the Woods, there are definitely some strange things going on in the real world. Specifically, a hole at the center of everything, as the cat puts it. Whatever it is, it's constantly growing hungrier and hungrier, and soon, it will consume all life leaving nothing left. Everything, everyone, all that makes up May, Greg, Bees, and Angus's reality are simply atoms, and they do not care if you exist. They do not care if anything exists, and that even the atoms themselves are simply products of reality. Monstrous existence. The beginning is moments ago, the end moments away. There's no time to forget before all is forgotten. This message of monstrous existence, the hopelessness that this creature conveys is so crushing on an initial playthrough. The idea that everything May has ever done and everything that she will ever do is simply monstrous existence. It's a theme that's present over all of Night in the Woods' story and setting. Possum Springs is dying. The restaurants that May used to love are gone. The mall emptying its stores one after another and even Casey Hartley are all just atoms floating in space, monstrous existence. And coming from a video game like Night in the Woods, that's just beautiful. And so we leave this dream. Despite everything that this beast says, we continue our quest for answers, and we wake up once more. The next day arrives, and it's time to go to the graveyard. This is Bee's mission. She only agreed to go on this crazy quest with us because she wanted to visit her mother's grave. Meanwhile, we are looking for the grave of one Joe Shade, one of the miners who died many, many years ago in a tragic explosion. It's a good time to mention that this mine and the miners in it play a major role in this game. It's everywhere. It's on murals, it's in the paper, people are talking about it, and it's even in the main story. At the graveyard, we can look at different graves, chat with the groundskeeper, and answer some questions from some weird teenagers. Eventually, after some good old-fashioned property damage, we find the grave of Joe Shade, where, big surprise, there isn't anything there. Even when we decide to straight up commit a crime, we don't get anything. Honestly, this mission also seems a little out of place. There's just not a lot to do here. Every other mission has some mini-game or a heartfelt chat, but this one just seems tedious. Oh well, let's get out of here. Wait a minute, is that the janitor? Oh man, nope. 
Uh-uh, not opening that can of worms just yet. On a completely different note, the next day, we can visit a church where our mom works to have a nice little chat with her. Apparently, the door to the library room is finally open, and we can go take a nap in there. And there's this amazing scene of May falling asleep on the couch in the library room of the church, while the ghost of her grandfather comes and sits beside her. This scene can last as long as you want it to, only ending when you yourself get up. Like, even through all the sh things that May has done, her grandfather still watches over her like a guardian angel. You can completely miss this scene if you just never went to the church, and I think it's one of the best in the entire game. Not a single word is spoken, yet it says so much. And now we have the final mission, Possum Jump. This is where Angus used to do scouts, so he knows the area pretty well. It's here where we learn that Angus has asthma and uses an inhaler. They chat about dinosaurs and how there used to be an ocean here before Possum Springs came about, and at the top, we sit down on a log and wait for the ghost to arrive. We play this cool mini game where we have to trace the stars to find constellations, and we learn a lot about Angus. He didn't exactly have the best childhood, being abused by both of his parents who would sometimes not even feed him. He didn't really believe in magic powers or anything, but he did believe that some kind of higher power brought him and Greg together. But he has a ton of weight on his shoulders and feels like he needs to make sure nothing bad ever happens to Greg. I love how the theme of he needs me, I need to be there for him shows up in both Greg and Angus's storyline. Greg feels like he needs to save Angus from the monotony of life, and Angus needs to save Greg from, well, himself. I also like how when we really get into the meat and potatoes of Angus, the dialogue switches from them talking to the constellations talking. It's a really cool little moment. Ah, what a nice heartfelt chat. It's really what this game's all about. Even though Angus is a smaller character, at least compared to Greg and B, he's still a person, and it would have been so easy to just not include this entire part of the game, but the developers decided to anyway. Oh yeah, and the ghost. At this point, May has had enough and confronts the ghost about its evil deeds. This proves to be a bad idea because the thing doesn't say anything, forcing May and Angus, who has asthma, to run all the way down the hill to the car while being chased by this thing that is, let's be honest, way faster than him. Oh man, that was insane. Thankfully it's all over now and we can go home. Uh-oh. Alright, now things are getting serious and May's had enough. She's done messing around. She's going up to those woods tonight to see what's really going on. Thankfully, our friends are a little bit more level-headed and follow us so we aren't by ourselves. We arrive at the woods past the basketball courts and trudge up the side of the hill where we find a bunch of old mining gear. May comments on how old it feels and how everything right here is just there every single night. Wow, she really does not like those minecarts. Moving forward, the lighting begins to turn eerily red, just like the dream, and we find a scene of real horror. A group of hooded figures similar to the ghost that May saw, and someone writhing in pain on the ground. Turns out this was the guy who left an arm outside of the diner at the beginning of the game, and now he's paying the ultimate price for it. They mention something about what's going to happen to this town, and other cryptic stuff like that before they cut the man's leg off to free him from a boulder he was trapped under. It's a terrifying scene to be sure, but it only gets worse when May gasps at the sight of the dying man. May? May Borowski? The figure shouts. It knows May by name. How does it know May by name? Well, there's no time to think about it now because it's time to run, run, go May, go, keep running, jump over those rocks, don't let them catch you, go, 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 come on. I'm young, I'm nimble, you'll never take me alive, I'm invincible. Oh, hey guys, what's up? I see you invited Germa over to your apartment. What a great time. Hey, where's May? So yeah, M-A-E is M-I-A, and nobody really knows what to do. It's here that we actually end up taking control of B, believe it or not. We can walk around Greg's apartment and talk to everyone there before addressing the uh, elephant in the room. That being the fact that May is 
probably dead. I mean, she was shot at and she's not in the house, so yeah, seems totally legit to me. The camera opens on a forest at the bottom of a cliff. The glare so intense that the scene looks like something out of a painting. May Borowski awakes at the bottom of this cliff and staggers out of the forest. Down the steps, past the basketball courts, past a supermarket that wasn't there, through what was once a bustling town square, to a mailbox that maybe, in a far off time, belonged to her. Now forgotten, the horrors of reality hitting her, the fact that one day, the town she grew up in, the people she knew, would just be another memory. Abandoned, never to return. They say time is the best teacher. Unfortunately, it kills all of its patients. The camera zooms out and fades to black. Back in the real world, May lies on a pew in the church while a pastor talks religion. Not much happens, but there's no time for something to happen. As the scene shifts to a hospital bed where May and her family are. Oh, hey, it's the janitor. I wonder what he's doing here. Uh, do we know you? Nah, I'm supposed to be fixing the door. In here? Nope. She's gonna be fine. For today, leastways. He leaves and May magically wakes up, having experienced the nightmare she just went through. She knows now that everything she knows and loves will be gone, and there's nothing she can do about it. Just atoms floating through space. Just shapes. She wakes back up in her bed and sneaks out of the house down to Greg's apartment. How she managed to do that is beyond me because she's staggering. B lets her in and they hit the hay. Now this next scene is different depending on whether or not you did Greg's story or B's story. Either way, the main theme is the same. May finally opens up about herself and why she left college. Throughout the entire game, other characters have alluded to some thing that May did around six years ago. That thing was beating a kid in the face with a baseball bat during a softball match. It's why she she has a journal that functions as a save mechanic. The doctor literally prescribed it to her. She explains that one day while she was playing video games, the people on screen and the things she was doing just broke and became nothing more than shapes. The tree outside her window, once like a friend greeting her in the mornings, now just a thing outside of her home. And the kid pitching in the softball game, just shapes and then red bloody shapes all over the grass. This is a very real thing called depersonalization disorder, and it's where those afflicted have trouble remembering things and end up decentralizing a lot of their reality. In severe cases, they perceive their own body shape as something different and sometimes can't even recognize themselves in a mirror. This actually would explain why every character in Night in the Woods is an anthropomorphic animal. They don't do things that animals do. They don't really show any animalistic behaviors. They're normal human beings, and we're perceiving them as May does in her reality. That moment is when May's reality broke, and she hasn't recovered since. This is why she had to come home from college. It just all became too much. The statue of the founder staring down at her reduced to meaningless shapes. She downed cough syrup to sleep and ate entire pizzas at once. She finally got up the nerve and called it quits and came home. But that was after all the suffering that she went through. It's also at this point where May realizes what she has to do. She gets up from the couch and heads back outside for one more night in the woods. Back at the forest, May comes face to face with her ghost or whatever. It says nothing in response to her demands, and before May can do anything drastic, it takes an arrow right in the shoulder. Turns out, Greg, B, and Angus followed May into the woods. At this point, they knew they weren't going to get her back home, so they went with her into the mine. Inside, they trek through old tunnels and May becomes more and more agitated. They go down an elevator and walk some more before coming into a completely dark room. The only light coming from B's dummy cigarette. May asks for answers and something in the darkness responds. How about this? Take a couple more steps forward if you want to die. Before lighting a lantern and revealing the scene. There they are! I'm gonna kill them! 
It turns out, May's ghost wasn't a ghost at all, but rather a member of some weird secret society of old guys. The quote-unquote ghost's name is Eid, and the catalyst for all of this madness. They actually apologized for shooting at May the other night. You see, they aren't bad people, they're just trapped in Possum Springs like everyone else. May asks if they could just leave, which the hooded figure, not Eid, responds with, Well, he brought you down here for a reason, and he isn't gonna let you leave until he had his say. To which May responds, Well, he's already got an arrow in the shoulder. Oh, little girl. You don't know what this is, do you? The hole in the center of everything. What the strange cat creature spoke of in May's dream. Whatever thing lives in that hole controls Possum Springs, and the men in this cave must feed its sacrifices to keep the town whole. If they don't, people leave. Kids leave, blizzards, floods, no jobs, Everything that's mentioned throughout the entire game that's a problem in Possum Springs came from this hole. This even includes the poem at the very start of the game. They have to kidnap people and throw them into the hole. Thankfully, they only take trailer park trash, criminals, and no good thieves with really no hope of contributing anything to society. People who steal. People who vandalize. People who do crimes. People like Casey Hartley. The kid whose parents put posters up saying he had gone missing. May's best friend. This whole time, Casey was down here, in the hole, along with who knows how many people. This sends Greg into a rage, where he threatens to kill the men with his crossbow. But he's outnumbered about 20 to 1, and the men have rifles. They talk of the man who found the hole, Ed Scudder and how he had something called the glimmer. Whatever the thing in the hole did to you, well, everyone said that old Ed could walk through walls. It's a vicious thing, the task these men have. An endless cycle of criminals meeting their end in this cave, keeping whatever future Possum Springs has alive just a little bit longer. And much like May herself, they're afraid. They're afraid of losing the town they love. They're afraid of losing the people they love. They're afraid of losing everything. They're holding on to the past like it's the only thing that they have left. It's sad, really. These men, they're old. They need new blood. People to continue on their horrid crusade of keeping Possum Springs breathing. Obviously, this does not appeal to our main characters, and surprisingly enough, the men in need just let us leave. So with May on Angus's back, we head back up the elevator. At least we know, now, that it's all over. Okay, now it's all over. I know what you are now. When I die, I want it to hurt. When my friends leave, when I have to let go, when this entire town is wiped off the map, I want it to hurt bad. Because that means it meant something. It means I am something. At least. We wake from the dream and are now somehow in good enough shape to climb up this well. And as we do, the music begins to swell. A triumphant sound of not just crawling out of a dank cave, but the sound of crawling out of the darkness. Finally understanding that despite everything that May Borowski has gone through, she's okay. And yeah, one day Possum Springs will die, and that there will be nothing left. And yeah, that one day her friends will all leave, and she'll have to move on. But for now, she's okay. And this final scene really impacted me. It's such a simple moment, but it has so much more meaning behind it. And just as we began this tale, this insane story, we head to band practice and have a quick chat with the gang. And then the game just...
Night in the Woods is the greatest story ever told in a video game. Somehow, Alec Holoka, Bethany Hockenberry, and Scott Benson have managed to craft a world that is so magical, yet so believable. This Rust Belt-inspired town struggling to survive in the modern day, forcing its residents to work three times harder to make ends meet is such a perfect atmosphere for a game like this. Again, a believable story with believable characters in a believable setting. And that's all you really need. And I'm so glad that Alec and Scott and Bethany can continue to make incredible video games for all of us to enjoy. This is the part of the video that I must put a trigger warning in. Because on August 31st, 2019, two years after Night in the Woods came out, Alec Coloca committed suicide. It's quite the strange case that we have here. Keep in mind, everything that has been accused of Alec and everything that I'm gonna talk about in this section of the video are purely allegations, and there's no real physical public evidence of any of these things that are going to be mentioned. This all started when Zoe Quinn, Alec's former girlfriend, accused him of repeated patterns of abuse. Isolation, erratic behavior, and violence were all things Alec apparently did seemingly at complete random. I'll leave it up to you to decide and I'll put a link to the Twitter thread where all of this came out, but even to this day, people still debate Zoe Quinn. I personally don't know, nor do I intend to have a viewpoint on this matter, but many people don't believe anything she said. My point is, we lost an incredible game designer, writer, and composer that day. Alec Coloca had not only so much potential to create other fantastic video games himself, but to help other developers make their dreams come true. Yeah, it's not fair. None of it is. But much like the game, time moves on, and there's nothing we can do about it. Scott Benson said it better than I ever could. The characters are us and people we've known. The places are ones that we know. It proves that Night in the Woods wasn't just a completely fictional idea from a couple of random people. It was a very personal project. Both Bethany and Scott lived in Pennsylvania, which was a huge part of the Rust Belt. And now that you know that, you can start to see resemblances between the real world East Coast and the town of Possum Springs. So with that out of the way, let's wrap this video up. Despite what you just heard, I still love Night in the Woods. It's one of the greatest, most charming, best written indie games I've ever played. Every year when fall comes and that fall smell begins, I replay this game and it gets me every time. I'm glad I was finally able to get all the way through this video because believe it or not, I rewrote the script about four or five times before actually recording it. So if you made it this far into the video, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Please, please, please subscribe and click the like button and leave a comment if you watch the whole thing. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace.